should get started so that we can um, uh, finish on time. Yes. So thank you all for either being back here again or being here for the first time. Um, it is really uh, important to us that we hear from um, all different parts of the community. So whether it's students in the schools or as teachers, the, the business office, and definitely from the community. Um, uh, yes, we actually do read your comments. So people have been thinking, oh, are you just going to throw your comments? No, in fact, we actually are reading every single one of them, and we think about them, and we take them into consideration. Um, the other thing, um, yesterday, I quickly mentioned about the fact that there's no, there are no women, so I addressed that. Um, but I, tonight's little quick topic is um, the reason that the school board is making this decision is because it is state law. It's, we make this decision. Um, and so that's, so that's that. Uh, but we really, it is really important to us that we are not making this decision alone. So that's why we actually are reading the comments. So there, so please fill them out, um, because it's important. Anyway, more importantly, this is Dr. Sean Carey, uh, emphasis on the doctor, and he can explain that. And thank you very much for being here. He's had a long day, but he's holding up pretty well. So thank you very much. Thank one, you so much. Welcome, welcome, Sean. One, one thing, if you weren't here last night, uh, you have three by five cards, and uh, Wayne Robertson here will be reading your questions. If you write them down, I'll collect them. Just stick them up, and I'll collect them. And if you don't turn any questions in, we'll read the questions we had last night. Uh, so, so write your own questions. That might work, you, but it may not be the question you want. So go at it, John. Good luck. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here this evening. I know that this probably, you know, they've talked a little bit about my long day and um, quite honestly, not really that long of a day for me. This is kind of a typical day for me in terms of uh, just being out doing the work that I do in schools. Um, probably a longer day from you from the stand or for you from the standpoint that you were, had your day job or you were doing your day thing and now you're at a night event. So. Um, I do appreciate you taking the time to come out and learn a little bit about me and also ask some important questions um, that will help the school board make a decision about um, who will best serve in the position that uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Michael Soltman is uh, vacating here soon. So uh, with that, um, I, <laughs> I I'm going to address the, uh, the comment that was made with the emphasis on the doctor uh, in my name. Um, I am not a person who is um, a person who needs a title in order to um, be of importance, I guess, or be someone who is of significance in the world. Um, and I learned that uh, very cruelly by one of my own children. Um, once I received my doctorate um, from WSU, go, go Cougs, um, um, my son, my oldest son, who is now in college, he's a freshman at uh, UC Davis, um, he used to inter introduce me to every one of his friends as Dr. Sean Carey. Um, but shortly after saying Dr. Sean Carey, he would say, yes, my dad is a doctor, but not the kind that helps people. So, um, so doctor really doesn't work for me. I'm Sean. Please refer to me as Sean. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, um, what I've done in order to kind of get myself to this place in, in life. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about why I am trying to choose Vashon. Um, and then I'll answer any questions that you might have for me. So the first thing is um, I've been an educator, professional educator for the last um, over two decades. I'll put it that way. I don't want you to know exactly how old I am, but I, I am a lot younger than I look. Um, so. Um, so I started off as an elementary school teacher. Um, I taught uh, primary reading um, support for a number, or actually for about a half a year. Then after that, I went into teaching fourth grade, and I taught fourth grade for about five years. From there, I got recruited to work as a middle school teacher, where I taught uh, social, excuse me, science and math. Um, following year, I taught social studies and language arts, and then I got a tap on the shoulder to go back to school. And I usually don't listen to um, people telling me what to do that aren't related to me, namely my wife. Um, but um, this person told me to go back to school. I went back to school for my ed, ed, or my um, edu educational um, admin credentials, and I then moved into a deanship. So I, I was a dean for a year. After being a dean for a year, I got hired as an elementary school principal. 
Uh, I served 11 years as an elementary school principal in a relatively large elementary school. Um, one of the best jobs I ever had. I just loved having that job. After that, I got tapped on the shoulder again, told to go back to school again by someone not in my family. Um, and I listened again. Um, and I went back and I, be, I got my doctorate and I moved into the central office administration. Worked as a, an assistant director, a director, uh, an executive director, and now I serve as an assistant superintendent in school district in the Tacoma area. That's a little bit about me. I, uh, you do have a bio page that talks a little bit about my family, uh, maybe some of my experiences. If you've got questions about that, I'm certainly more than willing to talk a little bit about that, but that tells you a little bit more about me as um, just kind of a person and, and how I've gotten to the place that I am right now in terms of being in the Pacific Northwest. So um, why Vashon? Why am I choosing Vashon? Why would I choose Vashon? Well, one of the things that um, I just shared with you is that one of the best experiences I had as a, a school employee is that of working as an elementary school principal. The reason why that was a great job for me was because it really helped me to totally immerse myself into a system, totally be a part of a system totally be a member of a community. That's what made it the best job for me. I had the opportunity to affect change in a way where I was working with the people, and not people working for me, but working with the people who were making a difference in the lives of the kids in that school. I believe that that's something that I can replicate for myself here in this community. I can get to know the kids very much like I knew the kids in my building. I can know them by name. I had a conversation with some high school students in this very same audio, um, auditorium a little earlier today, and I talked to them about um, eating lunch with them, sitting across from them, and they didn't cringe. Um, they didn't say, ooh, yuck. Um, they actually were very nice to me, so you've, you've raised some incredible kids here too. Um, but they were very open to the idea of me being a person who was truly engaged in their life, truly a part of their life. One of the things I always talked to the teachers that I worked with in my building was about the kids, once they walk through that door, being my kids. I'm the father of three biological kids. And I want the very best for my, my kids. I want them to have everything that is possible in a public education, which I believe public education is the best education that anyone could possibly receive. When your kids walk through the door, they're my kids. I care about them. I want them to know I care about them. I want them to know that I want the very best for them from the people who are working with them every day. I think I'll have the opportunity to experience that here at Vashon. I, I certainly could talk a little bit more about that. Um, I, and, I, and I hope that what you're seeing from me and I hope that what you're hearing from me is the passion that I have about education and the passion that I have about working with a community like yours. I want to become the person that you choose to be, um, a friend of the family a friend of the community. I know that the only way that I can do that is through earning your trust, following through with what I say is important in the lives or for the lives of our kids, and ultimately getting our kids, all of our kids, 100% of our kids across the finish line. So that's a little bit about why I've chosen Vashon. I'm going to turn it over to you to ask questions. I'll do my very best to answer those questions. Um, um, I'm not yet feeling the effects of the, um, I think it's close to a 14 hour day just yet. <laughs> so um, if I do, I'll let you know. Um, and if that clouds my, uh, my response to any of your questions, I'll certainly let you know that as well. But I am ready for your questions. How will you change your approach? 
So how will a small district be different than the district that I work in right now? So that's the first part of the question. So um, where I work right now, we are actually considered a small school district. Um, and that's with 8,500 students. So um, I am surrounded by school districts, and I'm, I'll do the calculations in my mind. To the west, there's a school district that has roughly 20,000 students. To the north of us, we have a school district that has roughly 30,000 students. To the east, we have a school district that's got oh, right around 18,000 students. And to the south of my school district, we have another school district that's right around 18,000 school um, 18,000 students. So I work in a small school district, or at least a small school school district, relatively. Um, making the transition to a to a a, a much smaller school dris, district is. I think it speaks to exactly the um, kind of the reason why I'm choosing a smaller school district like this. It will give me the opportunity to make personal connections with the kids that I would serve in this community, make personal connections with the people that I would work with on a daily basis, make personal connections with the community members, make personal connections with the people who entrust the most important people to them to me, or in me, sorry. So uh, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking, I'm looking to make that connection. So make it, I, I think the second part of the question was making the transition. Will you change your approach? Or will I make, change my approach? Um, certainly there are things that I would change in my approach. Um, you know, I'll tell you right now, one of the things that I don't get to do in, in my small school district is I don't get to know every student. There are a handful of students that I've got to know very well. There, you know, there are a couple of uh, hundreds of students that I know their names still, but I don't know everyone. And that's the approach that I would change if I were working in Vashon, is that I would want to know the names of everyone that I serve on a daily basis. And I'd want them to know me too. Okay, we'll jump into the deep end of the pool. Michael Saltman's stance on districts, the district's involvement in politics is one of neutrality. What is your position? Well, I can't, I can't say anything um, regarding um, Michael, Michael Saltman. Um, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know anything about his, um, his focus on that particular arena. I will tell you that for me, I see my role as superintendent of Vashon Schools as one where I have to be politically involved. We have a lot of folks in Olympia who make decisions every day about what happens in schools that don't know very much about what happens in schools. And so what I need to do is I need to serve as the advocate for Vashon Schools and Vashon students. I need to serve as that person who knows who our senator is, Senator Nelson. I need to know who the representatives from the 34th legislative district are. And I need, to, I need to make sure that they know that when they see me coming, they know that Sean is there to talk about his kids. And he's there to talk about what his kids need. That's my stance. I need to be an educator of the people who work in Olympia and help them understand what it is that we need in order for our kids to get the world-class world education that they deserve through our public education system. Okay. On Saturday, I heard you say that you operate from a set of non-negotiables. Zabet also listed a set of non-negotiables. How can the two most powerful people in the district both stake out a set of non-negotiables and still be good listeners and collaborators with the other people in the district and community? Great question. So my non-negotiables are grounded in my morals and my ethics. Um, I don't believe that they're non-negotiables that most people would disagree with or wouldn't be their own non-negotiables. I believe in fairness. I believe in justice. I believe in treating people the way that you want to be treated. I believe that those are, those are non-negotiables that most people have or really should have. 
So I don't see my non-negotiables as a conflict with anybody else's non-negotiables. And if they are, then let's talk about it. I'd love to talk about it. One question I did not hear the school board ask on Saturday was addressing Vashon's reputation for academic rigor and excellence. Kids have been getting into great colleges and performing really well. How would you maintain academic rigor while also addressing issues of equity with finite resources? So um, on Saturday, I did talk about the knowledge that I have, which is relatively limited. Um, but the knowledge that I have based on the research that I've done about how well you folks have done in terms of preparing your students for success beyond high school, actually exiting high school and then beyond high school. You've done a fantastic job, amazing job. And I acknowledge that on Saturday. I'll say again, you've done an amazing job. What I'm looking to do is I'm looking to capture the rest of those kids the kids who haven't graduated. And I think we can all agree that by looking at the data um, that we don't have 100% of our students who are making it across the finish line. So my goal is to make sure that we are employing whatever strategies are necessary, having whatever plans are, are, are required in order to make sure that we capture 100 percent of our students, that we graduate 100 percent of our students and get them ready for success beyond high school. And success is going to look different for some of these kids. It's going to look like a, it's going to look like an apprenticeship. It's going to look like a trade. It's going to look like something other than a four-year school. I have a student, I, well, I have a child of my own who is in a college right now, UC Davis. Great school. He made it there from a public school. He was very, very well accomplished in his um, high school career. There's nothing that I would change for your students in terms of making sure that they are equally accomplished in their high school careers. And I hope I answered that question. You want that again, or you okay on that? Yeah, um, just think, to make sure. I think you got it. The last part was with finite resources. Finite resources. Um, again, that goes back to the question about making sure that I know who our legislators are, um, because even though our legislature and, and our legislature is, has done um, yeoman's job in terms of working to fulfill the promise of a education for all students fully funded. But they're not there yet. They aren't. So we'll continue to, we'll continue to, to um, educate our students in the best way possible given the resources that we have. But we'll still keep asking for more. How would you explain your position on equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome? Equality, opportun equality of opportunity means that every student needs to have the opportunity to have success. They need to have the playing field leveled and leveled is probably not the correct term, but they need to have the playing field in such a way that they have the opportunity to have successes regardless of their circumstances, their station in life, whatever you have, whatever it would be. Opportunity for success is left up to the individual. That's the difference between someone having grit and determination versus somebody saying that I need to have something handed to me. I believe, that, I believe that we need to provide every student with the opportunity to have the skills for success. What they do with those skills, hopefully we've taught them what to do with those skills. But what they do with those skills are really up to, them, to themselves. 
How will you work toward implementing the board's racial equity policy? How can the school district make sure that students of color and LGBTQ students feel supported by their school and that all students learn how to be allies? Uh, and I've talked about this question quite a bit today um, or responded to questions that are similar to this one today. Um, um, one of the things that I applaud Vashon schools for is the fact that they've actually taken action um, with regard to racial equity in schools by having, number one, just a, a board policy that speaks to it. The moment you put something in writing, that makes it real. And it also implies a level of accountability. And so my expectation is that um, the job of the superintendent is to make sure that that level of accountability is followed through with. I'll be the person who will be the champion for that policy, for that, for that um, focus in our community with all of our students. Everyone deserves to be treated with respect and with dignity and to have every opportunity to become this person that they were supposed to be, their best possible self. The superintendent will need to be that champion. Okay, we have several questions on high, achieve, high achieving students and um, high, high cap program. So I'm gonna ask them, so there'll be some repetition. Okay. But I don't wanna, they're a little different, so I don't wanna leave anything out. People went to the trouble of writing them, so we want to address them. So um, most general is probably how would you grow, how would you grow, how would you address and grow the high cap program? This one's very similar. How would you ensure academic social success for high achieving and high capable, highly capable students in the district? So program and uh, academic and social success. Little. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think they go together, but maybe not. Okay. So um, as the father of um, some students who do really well in school, um, they, would, they, would, they would be, I, I guess they'd be classified as students who are high, highly capable. Um, actually, I guess that's the term that's being used. Uh, or, so um, my expectation is that um, we would create a system where we meet kids where they are and we give them what they need in order to be more successful. Um, so our instructional programs need to be rigorous enough to meet the needs of those students. Not just on that end of the spectrum, but also on the other end of the spectrum. Um, so even for our students who are not academic, academically able or talented, we need to make sure that we have a system in place for them as well. I guess what I'm saying is we need to have a system that's comprehensive enough and that's rigorous enough to meet the needs of all of our students. Um, we need to make sure that our teachers get the professional development that they need in order to make sure that the rigor is appropriate for every student that they serve. And then I need to inspect what it is that we are expecting, which is greatness from all of our students. Hopefully I answered that question. Okay, we're gonna keep building on that. Okay. Um, the first part, this is a two-part question. I think you answered the first part. So the first part is, can you speak to the special needs of highly capable students? You might want to hit that a little more. And then, do you think that embedded honors meets their needs? Okay, so um, I guess I, can you read that first question again? Just Can you speak to the special needs of highly capable students? Well, they need to be exposed to a rigorous um, curriculum. They need to make sure that we are prepared to provide them with an opportunity to learn at the highest possible level. And again, I, I think that that can be tailored for any student along the spectrum. Um, and it should be tailored for any student along the spectrum. Second part of that question was? Um, do you think that embedded honors, in quotes, meets their needs? I'm not familiar with that term, Specific embedded program. honors. Yeah. Is that a district program? Yeah. Embedded honors means that you have students of varying levels in a classroom, mm -hmm. but a student can earn an honors designation by doing deeper, richer work. So not just more work, 
but um, you're trying to meet the needs of those higher level kids by embedding it in the classroom. So they're heterogeneous mixing, mm -hmm. but they have an opportunity to do additional work um, to get this designation. Okay, and so is it an award or is it a... a in a gen ed class. Is it a... Is it a Okay. Um, I'll be very honest with you and I'll tell you that I'm not familiar with that term and I'm not familiar with that particular um, um, aspect of a, an honors course that you're talking about. I, um, so I'd have to research that a little bit more and, and then I could be able to, 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 to engage you in a conversation about that and, and how we might build something like that into um, the current program that we have here. But um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't, I don't know enough to, to be able to talk about that. Okay, now we have three similar questions, but each one's different because it speaks to a different level of elementary, middle, high school. So okay. First one is a broad question. Broadly, if you became school superintendent, how would you ensure a progression of academic excellence through all three schools? So that's Okay, so why don't I answer that question? So I think it's extremely important that um, as we talk about um, what instructional programs look like in our schools, that there's vertical alignment, that we have alignment that, um, well, the alignment would include conversation with teachers at all levels about what best practices look like and what instructional programs should look like for all students and how it follows from kindergarten all the way up to 12 in terms of um, what we're providing students in terms of rigor and challenge. Okay, then building on that, specifically, how would you ensure un undisrupted learning environments in all elementary and middle school classrooms? So I've been in education for some time now, and I can tell you that um, that's one of the things that, um, <laughs> um, that's like a politician, that's like uh, me standing up here like a politician and, and getting ready to give you a promise that I won't ever be able to keep. Um, and I won't do that to you. I just won't do that to you. So there's absolutely no way that I can ensure that there will never be a disruption. But one of the things that I can tell you is that we will ensure that we have systems in place to deal with disruptions that happen and we'll, we'll deal with those um, disruptions appropriately within the context of the programs that we have in place. We'll deal with those, those um, disruptions appropriately given the training that we'll provide our teachers with in order to deal with those, those disruptions. Okay, lastly, what measures would you take to ensure a rigorous and celebrated academic culture for our college-bound high school students? And I'm not sure if I'm, yeah, I don't want to repeat myself. Um, well, yeah, the questions are related, so okay. you may have to do a little bit of that. Okay, so um, I could understand. again, I think it's extremely important that we have in place rigorous programs that are designed to meet the needs of every student who walks through the door. And when I mean rigorous program, I mean we assess a student, we see where a student is, and then our program is specifically tailored to the needs of that particular student. And again, it is, it is basically, it covers the spectrum. It will cover students who are low performing all the way those, through to those students who are very high performing. We need to have a robust, a robust instructional program for all students. At the risk of making you repeat yourself. <laughs> okay. In the drive for social accommodations, solid core <laughs> academics seem at risk of taking a back seat. How will you ensure that while the district strives to meet the needs of an academically diverse student body, it maintains its academic integrity and, prides, and provides four-year college-bound students a quality education? And secondary to that, how do the needs of high-achieving students fit into the plan? So. So can you read the first, sure. I want to make sure I understand the first part of that question. In the drive for social accommodations, solid core academics seems at risk of taking a back seat. How will you ensure that while the district strives to meet the needs of an academically diverse student body, it, maintain, 
It maintains its academic integrity and provides four-year college-bound students a quality education. So I'll say, I'll say again um, that it's extremely important that we design an instructional program that, is des that meets the needs of all the students regardless of where they come to us at. I currently work in a school district where we have students who come to us with limited skills and we come to and students come to us with great skill. We have a framework in place. It's called multi-tiered systems of support for academics. That framework is designed so that it provides the appropriate amount of rigor, instructional rigor, to each student based on where their baseline is. That's the type of system that I would want to have in place for the students here in Vashon. That's what I, you have, you have that to a certain extent already in place, but I think that there's some there's some professional de development that we could do. I think that there's some additional training that we can do to firm that up so that, that I think, or so that we have a system in place that's more comprehensive. Okay. For a variety of reasons, some we don't even know yet, there seems to be an anxiety epidemic among kids. How do you create a robust, rigorous academic environment while dealing with mental health challenges like pervasive anxiety? Well, um, one of the things that is really unique about Vashon Schools is the fact that um, you've got a community health, pro, um, a health clinic in your schools. Um, so I think that it's extremely important that we employ some of the same strategies that are being used in your community health program here in schools into our, our, um, our curriculum, if you will. Um, we need to make sure that kids are aware of how they're feeling or how their feelings affect their ability to learn. Um, and then that's something that we have to continue to, to, to do a process check with. We have to continue to engage our students in um, um, helping us understand you know, the things that, that are stressors for them and how we help them move beyond those stressors so that they don't impede their learning, their academic performance. Okay, I'll shift gears here. How would you strengthen and grow a comprehensive special education program in our district? So I've already touched on this a little bit, um, but I'll, I'll kind of reiterate it a little bit more. Um, I believe that a comprehensive MTSSA program is appropriate. Multi-tiered systems of supports for all students at both ends of the spectrum providing teachers with training to be able to identify what the appropriate type of rigor is or should be for students based on assessment, assessments that we provide them with or provide them um, in order to figure out where it is that they are on the continuum of learning. That's what I would have in place. Okay, two questions about standards-based grading. I'll read them both because I think it's probably two questions with probably a common answer. First one, what is your opinion of standards-based grading? Are you aware of the current controversy in the district? Many parents and teachers disagree with its use in the schools, especially at VHS. And standards-based grading, especially at Vashon High School, is a controversial issue in the district among many parents, students, and teachers. What is your opinion of standards-based grading and how or if it should be implemented? Well, standards grace baiting has been um, scrant, <laughs> standards base. Oh, there we go. Um, I think it's now starting to kick in that whole. Uh, <laughs> um, so standards based grading has been around for some time now, um, and um, you know my own children have been um, they've been exposed to it. I've got a sophomore in, in high school right now who um, goes to an area uh, high school who is he, he works through standards based grading on a daily basis. Um, I have a, a son who graduated um, from a standard space high school. Um, I'll tell you that I didn't understand it very well when it was first implemented 
or at least when I first knew about it, it was it was in place prior to my student, my children going to, to um, high school. Um, but I don't. It is. It was never. A, it was never um, an obstacle for my student for my kids to overcome. Um, they've still had every opportunity to be successful in school and to move beyond high school into a second, uh, you know, into a post um, secondary uh, university. Um, so, and, and maybe I'm not doing justice in answering this question correctly. So, um, Dr. Ro Robertson, if you could ask that question just one more time, I just want to make um, sure that I'm. What is your opinion of standard based grading? Are you aware of the current controversy in the district? Many parents and teachers disagree with its use in the schools, especially at Vashon High School. Okay, so They're the one thing that I didn't offer is my opinion, and I don't know if my opinion really, you know, matters. Um, my opinion was I didn't understand it very much to begin with when my students, my children were going, were going through it, and so I needed to ask more questions. And until I started asking questions, until I, I really started to understand why it was being implemented, um, maybe I wasn't such a big fan. Once I understood why it was implemented, once that I understood that it was about making sure that my child masters content, has multiple opportunities to master content, then I became a bigger fan. Um, I believe that that is the, at, the, at the heart of learning. I believe that that's the reason why we go to school every day is so that we can master content, so that we can understand what it is that we're supposed to learn. And sometimes it takes more than, or at least it does for me, it takes more than one shot hearing something before I truly understand something. And to provide students with more opportunities to truly master the content, I think that's what makes our population more educated, more learned. We live near, we live amidst nature near the business hub of technology. How will you help our science curriculum excel? Um, you do have some, you've, you've got some beautiful property here and you've got some amazing learning spaces for students that are, um, for lack of a better way of saying it, non-traditional. Um, and that's a that's actually a draw for me. I, I mean, I'm I'm really excited about that. I shared with some high school students today that um, one of the things that I like to do, uh, and my family likes to do, is we like to camp. Um, so, um, outdoor education, environmental education, that's something that I I have a passion for. How would I grow it? Well, I I don't know enough about how you do environmental education or um, um, outdoor education to talk to you about how I would grow it other than to say I'm a supporter and I would listen and learn from you about how it is that we could make that an even stronger program. Okay. There's a need for both clear rules and child independence and leadership. How do you balance these needs? Okay, ask that question one more time. I'm trying to organize that in my mind here. I think it, in the school setting. Oh, okay. There's a need for both clear rules mm -hmm. and child independence mm -hmm. and leadership. How do you balance these needs? Well, um, I balance them by making sure that safety, security, um, and ability to actually do one's job when they come to school are always at the forefront for every student. So I'm not going to allow, I, I, I want to make sure that stu once these, when students come to school that they are able to um, um, feel like they're in a safe place where they can learn. I want them to make sure that they feel like they have the, um, you know, they have unfettered opportunities to learn um, and um, that there are supports in place for them to learn. Can you give us your vision for school quality, for a school quality continuum? Right now, this person believes, the schools feel like different quality and culture. Again, vertical alignment is important. 
Um, I think it's important um, to make sure that our elementaries, middles, and high school are all have staff talking to one another in order to make sure that our programs are aligned so that our students are s experiencing success throughout the system um, and experiencing success in similar ways at different levels within the system. Okay, there's two questions, but really one question. Um, how do you address complaints regarding underperforming faculty and how will you handle complaints about teacher performance? Well, um, one of the first things that I would do is I would make sure that um, um, that person, whoever's complaining, whoever's issuing the complaint, has had an opportunity to speak with the building principal um, and had an opportunity to, to work through their complaint or their issue with an underperforming staff member with the building principal because that person's going, um, the building principal is going to know that person better than anyone. I would also hope that um, I would hope that the basis for calling someone an underperforming employee is something uh, more substantial than sometimes I, there have been situations, at least situations that I've been in, where um, um, it was more of a personality conflict versus versus an actual performance um, issue with the teacher. I'd want to make sure that it's that's not the case. And again, I think that the building principal has to be a primary participant in that type of conversation. It would be addressed, especially if it's legitimate and it is truly about performance. Okay, these two questions, um, very similar. Um, over the last several years, Bashan Island School District has pursued an aggressive off-island student recruitment campaign. Mm -hmm. Considering the pros and cons of this strategy, do you believe it should continue? And another person says, I've watched class sizes steadily increase in the district over the past several years. We now have middle school, math, science, and humanities classes with 30 or more students. Will you evaluate the district's policy of recruiting off-island students to bring our class sizes back down? Um, one of the things that I have learned in my research, and it's limited research, is that um, um, one of the ways that you've been able to, to keep programs in place, one of the ways that you've been able to keep um, um, what I believe you like about um, Bashan schools is by making sure that you keep your enrollment steady. Um, one of the things I know as a fiscal manager is that once your FTE goes down, so that so do the number of dollars that you have available to you in order to um, continue with your programs. So um, I, I don't want to give an off-the-cuff answer to this question from the standpoint of saying that I think you know, you know, we really need to evaluate whether or not you know you're still maintaining the FTE, um, bringing those students, those off-island students, over to the island. Um, because that's a dollars and cents issue too. Um, if there are specific issues around those students who come to the island that need to be addressed, um, if you've got some concerns other than, um, um, you know, I, I, I heard class size, um, you know, I guess the, the question I would have is whether or not the class sizes are within the limits that um, the community has agreed are appropriate. Um, if it's something larger than that, I think I'd, I'd want to know more about that. Um, otherwise, you know, there's a pitch, there's the potential for us losing dollars um, that run the the programs that matter most in our buildings by cutting the number of students actually coming to the island. Okay, please describe an ethical dilemma that you have faced and the process you used to come to a response slash action. Ethical dilemma. Yeah, ethical dilemma. Um, well, um, I can tell you that as, um, as an HR professional, um, I'm faced with a lot of ethical dilemmas on a regular basis. Um, and um, um, 
<laughs> many of which I can't talk about. <laughs> so, um, um, so uh, I can I can give you a hypothetical situation that might be real, um, but I wouldn't be able to use you know identifiers, especially since this I believe this is being taken. Um, yes, it is sent somewhere. So uh, that's tricky too. Um, um, Speaking, I have, speak generally as to how you handle <laughs> ethical dilemmas. So I handle ethical dilemmas um, with moral integrity and in doing what I know is the right thing to do, regardless of whether or not there are people in the organization, in the organization who believe that um, we shouldn't do it or we can ignore it. I am not fearful of making the right decision or making a hard decision if it is the right thing to do. Um, I have had many opportunities in my relatively short career um, to affect employment status of, of people, um, livelihoods, um, I've had to make so, a lot of difficult decisions. And each one of those decisions, especially when I was affecting someone's livelihood, their ability to, to make a living, I've done that through the lens of using my moral compass and doing what was right. Even if, even if there were those who believed that I could do it a different way, or I could ignore. I could look beyond. I still did it, and I would do it again today. What's an example of a time when you failed, and what did you learn? <laughs> Just one time, or? Um, um, no, uh, so uh, an example of a time when I failed. Um, oh gosh, and again, um, I just there. This would be so much easier if I weren't being taped. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, um, so, uh, so uh, I will say to you that um, I've had professional goals that I've set before, that I've, in my estimation, I've failed at. Um, but one of the things that I've tried to do and, and I believe that I need to teach students how to do is to continue to persevere. Um, perseverance is a thing that sometimes gets lost on our generation simply because um, it's hard to do. And so, um, you know, I, I'm giving you a really general answer to the, a really specific question and for, unfortunately I just, you know, I, um, I, I think it's, it would be inappropriate for me to give you a, a specific example, given I've got to go to work tomorrow, <laughs> so. <laughs> what do you feel is your proudest accomplishment in your career? Um, um, Yana, student of mine, or elementary student of mine, um, graduated last year. Graduated from high school last year, and she received, we have in our district, we have um, scholarships that are given to um, underprivileged students, full rides um, to the local university, Pacific Lutheran University. She earned one of those scholarships. She emailed me, um, well, probably about four weeks before her graduation and emailed me something to the effect, Dr. Carey, will you please come to graduation? I really want you to see what I did. Um, I haven't talked to Yana in oh, probably nine years. The fact that she would reach out to me 
and ask me to be at graduation, which I had to be at anyway. Um, so, but uh, that she would ask me to be there and to watch her receive this honor, this um, award for all of her hard work, meant the world to me. And I was just her, I was just her elementary school principal. I had the opportunity to work with her teacher to make sure that she got the best possible education that we could give her. I probably served her lunch once or twice when our lunch lady let me touch the lunches. And I'm almost convinced that there may have been one or two times where she let me beat her at tetherball at recess. Beyond that, I wasn't a big stake in her life, or at least I didn't think I was. But the fact that she would reach out to me and she would ask me to be there specifically to watch her graduate and then come up to me and hug me, the HR guy <laughs> who, um, I, if, I don't know if you know anything about HR guys, we don't, we're not supposed to hug anyone. <laughs> so, uh, and especially not in public. Um, so, um, and that sounds worse too, because we don't do it in private either. Um, um, but, uh, but for me to be there to experience that with her and for her to give me that personal invitation because I meant something to her, that was, that was a real treat for me. And that was last year. Do you have the same passion for staff development and performance as you do for students? Absolutely. And that's because that's where the rubber meets the road. If you get this job, are you planning on moving to Vashon or commuting from Tacoma? That's well, a um, <laughs> uh, that question I've been asked a couple of times today. Um, and, the, and the short answer is yes. <laughs> no, um, the answer is I would expect to be a member of this community. I would expect to be here. Now, I do have a partner in life um, who sometimes has more of a say about things than I do. Um, I think she is on board as of today. Um, so if she gives us a go ahead and if we are um, made an offer we can't refuse, I would expect to be here. What hobbies do you have? I am an avid Watcher of movies when I have time, um, and that's not very often. Um, hobbies that I have, I I like to I like to work with wood. Um, that's always that's been something that I've done since I was a middle schooler. Um, really quick qu um, story. Um, so my wood my wood shop teacher um, um, was a was a very interesting man. Um, <laughs> And um, made an impression, um, and uh, yeah, I, I can't tell the rest of that story because um, it's inappropriate for young people in here. So, um, so anyway, I will just say to you, he did um, eventually inspire in me a love for working with wood and seeing what I could create with my own hands. And so that's something that I really do like doing. Um, yes, I do like watching movies, um, uh, especially when I can go with my kids and, um, you know, we can annoy um, my wife, their mom, um, as we're talking about things that are happening in the movie while she is trying to silently watch the movie. Um, so I like doing that as well. What do you see as the next big opportunities for Vashon Island School District? I see the next big opportunity for Vashon School being um, going from being very, very good to great. That's the opportunity. And I measure greatness by making sure that every student gets across the finish line. Every student. We're not leaving one student behind. Not one of my kids is not going to make it. Last question. What makes you the best candidate for the position of superintendent? <sighs> I 
my passion, my, sin my sincerity, uh, my honestness, my ability to connect, my true love of kids. And my desire to, to hopefully make this place just, and what I mean by place is this community, this state, this nation, just a little bit better by my daily effort. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time. Well, you guys were tough tonight. Tough questions, but good questions. So thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Uh, and thank you, Sean, for hanging in there on a 15-hour day now, going on 16. But uh, we have one more candidate tomorrow night, and we hope you'll be here for that and uh, to give not only yourselves an idea what all the candidates are like, but also to help the school board as they make their decision as who's to be your new superintendent. So thank you for being here tonight, and uh, hopefully we'll see most of you tomorrow night. Thank you. Have a great night. Explore so much. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So, yes. <laughs> I'll see you there. Okay, so 6 a.m.